yeah, this is one of the spots where they really get it good. They get it right. The heart of what he's getting at here is right. Um, life can be mystic and God can be experienced in all of life. But how he gets at it in this text probably either needs more explanation or it's a bit off. They're importantly different because rationality builds Towers of Babel. Babel's not necessarily about rationality. It's about assuming that humans can dwell with the divine and that their own name can be be the greatest. The, 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 the making a name great will actually be contra in chapter Genesis 11 will be contrasted in Genesis 12, where, where God says to Abraham, I will make your name great. So God is the one who has to make a name great. Hey everyone, this is Witcher Pastor and tell you today I'm on with jo Dr. Kretko again. We're going to be talking about Jordan Peterson's series on the Exodus. It's going to be uh, this is going to be part two. Uh, we did part one. Make sure to check that out. Uh, notes before we begin, we're going to be talking about uh, you know what they said, but we're not going to talk about literally everything. What they said would be here forever. Uh, we're going to talk about some quotes. We're going to pull up their videos, the ones that have been posted on YouTube at least for copyright reasons. We're not going to play the actual video. Um, and finally, uh, in this episode, the second part, they mention how Greg Hurwitz is a novelist, comic book writer, and he joins the show of, uh, to make it an even more interesting group. Okay, so first of all, they get into Exodus 3, 1 to 4, where God appears to Moses in a burning bush. Uh, Blackwood starts it off by saying, there is this uh, very beautiful moment moment in which Moses turns aside from where he is to go and attend, and that it's only because he's open to the possibility of turning aside that he sees the burning bush. And the revelation that is in that is able to unfold in his life. So he's engaged in some sense in an instrumental activity, right? He's about his own business, but he's open enough to what isn't within his framework of reference. Let's say to know when something is significant, that calls to him and then humble enough to pay attention to it. And that's where he encounters God. Beautifully said, uh, what are your thoughts on that one? I am I'm into it. I think, yeah, this is one of the spots where they really get it good. They get it right. Uh, this is um, this is what happens because it's off to the side and Moses looks and he has to actually go and, and, and do it. It's this kind of subtle call of God and he has to exercise his agency to go over and engage. So I like that. It's almost kind of this test motif that you see where you get different characters tested in different ways by God throughout the Pentateuch. Um, you see it um, uh, especially on mountains. So Abraham's tested on a mountain. Moses is currently on Horeb on Mount Sinai in this in this uh, narrative. You see it. You see it elsewhere. Um, obviously, Adam and Eve on the cosmic mountain. Uh, Noah, in a sense, on the mountain uh, with the vineyard coming after. I guess it might not be necessarily on the mountain, but a test of what happens in a failure. Potentially a test, at least in Noah's case. So yeah, I, it's it's good. Uh, I I agree. I think it's I think he, he makes a, a great point here. And not everything in these videos is is wrong or wrongheaded. <laughs> yes, sir. Okay, so hey, chat. Subscribing to our YouTube channel allows us to help our watchers understand the Bible better. Thanks to your help, we have already reached thousands of people in their walk with Christ. If you'd like to help further our efforts. Tap the subscribe button, which will allow us to reach even more people. You forgot to tell them to turn on bell notifications. Wait, they have to subscribe and click a bell now? Uh, the Prager makes this weird comment that I've never heard before. He says that burning bushes would be, would be seen by shepherds regularly. Do you know if that's an actual thing? I mean, how do you, in wherever the text is, whenever the text is set, can you say that they regularly see burning bushes? I've never been a shepherd in ancient uh, deserts around Israel. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I wonder maybe. if like, yeah, I wonder if maybe there's this idea that shepherds burn bushes randomly to, for fire. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I guess I would have. Yeah. What are their collection practices for kindling and wood? And yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Okay, uh, so this is going to be something you know more about. Uh, Stephen Blackwood notes that there's a sense, you know, he says, you know, dude, take off your sh shoes because the ground which you're standing is holy. I mean, there's this real question of, you know, is everything holy ground? I mean, it's not the world that changes, right? It's <clears throat> our own perception of the world that changes. And, you know, I, I would say that there's no moment in life that does, isn't in, in itself actually holy it's a matter of coming to be open or to be revealed as holy in your life. So there's no moment that isn't, is that is, cannot be redeemed or made 
epiphanic so epiphanic yeah what, yeah, what do you think about that yeah uh i think the thought is good but i think the terminology might not be right when we're talking about the story in exodus uh, the idea of holy ground in exodus and in the pentateuch and elsewhere it's not some ethereal thing that has to do with one's senses and the perception of a situation uh, holy ground is a specific uh concept in the ancient near east it's the concept of sacred space so we in our modern context uh we kind of see every all of matter in places it's the same some places might be more interesting than others but we kind of view everything the same um, i mean some people might revere a cathedral being in there or something like that so maybe that's getting closer to this idea of sacred space but ancients held that in some places um they were set up to, so as to con contact or con excuse me contact the divine in a real way uh, the important distinction from Peugeot's line of thought is that uh, maybe it's not Peugeot here who's talking, but uh, uh, but the important distinction here is that uh, not all places are actually holy. A place must be made holy by the deity, and usually those places were temples and the inner parts of temples. Um, the sacred space, uh, it's it's holy in that it's in proximity and in use of the deity. And this is how the author of Exodus would have understood the idea of holy ground. It's not just everywhere all at once and just a matter of, you know, gazing hard enough and you see it. Um, that's not how they they perceived of, of sacred space. So this is a temple kind of imagery and uh, symbolism going on here. And because it's Sinai, which will eventually become um, a pseudo or maybe even real tabernacle experience, tabernacle being temple, um, the this, this sacred space experience, he's on Horeb. So it's, it's kind of a foreshadowing of what's to come which is the true sacred space or the full sacred space of the tabernacle and of the top of sinai um the holy of holies in essence which you see in chapter 24 and um uh, in 19 and so that's what it's getting at here this idea of holy ground for, for us today does that mean that uh god can't be experienced everywhere or that moments aren't like mystical in the world me in this world on a planet floating in the middle of nowhere with stars and stuff. like that's all very cool and profound and mysterious um but uh is that to say that that's the same thing as holy ground no um god's tabernacling presence as well is now said to be um by his spirit in the christian perspective so his presence is in his people uh but not in this exterior physical space like the temple right so it's the people are the sacred space so what the heart of what he's getting at here is right um, life can be mystic and god can be experienced in all of life but how he gets at it in this text it probably either needs more explanation or it's a bit off yep so then they get on to exodus 3 4 6 and we have the clip posted on youtube so let's get into that one and moses hid his face for he was afraid to look upon god i read in Jung years ago this idea that I found extraordinarily compelling and useful, which was that every ideal is simultaneously and necessarily a judge. And so you imagine that the ideal is something that beckons to you, but you're also, you also pale in comparison to the ideal. And so by apprehending an ideal, you're also simultaneously judged. And the higher the ideal, the more intense the judgment in some real sense. I think that's partly why people are terrified of great art, like Michelangelo's David. I read a great commentary on that. The commentator suggested that the statue calls upon you to be far more than you are. So there's that judgment. And I think part of what happens to Moses here is that he's afraid to look upon God, the God of Abraham that calls people to adventure, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God that calls people to adventure and sacrifice and, and then out of slavery as well, is that ideal that's ultimately terrifying in some real sense. And so Moses hides his face for he was afraid to look upon God. Their negotiation is interesting to me because God sort of comes forth here and lists his bona fides, right? Because he says, I'm your God, I'm the God of your people. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's very interesting, the back and forth between him and Moses. And so you know, he, he it's sort of, he, he's almost proving the case that he's the God to be set before other gods mm -hmm. by identifying him as the God of his people. And certainly the God to be set bef before other gods by Moses, right. given, his, given his cultural heritage, right? So I'm not only God, I'm not only this transcendent figure that, that you would assume might be behind the unconsumed burning bush, but the more particularized God that's already been identified as part of this tradition. Hmm. Right, and, and based on uh, what Stephen was saying, Moses's reaction to what to God's call is also one of attention. 
you know, he says, here am I, here I am. That's all he can do. He can just, I'm, I'm here and I'm paying attention to what is happening. And this phrase is so important that it's repeated in other places in the Bible. You see it in the story of Samuel, for example, who has that same reaction. He hears the call and all he can say is, I am here and I am attending now. And so, so, so it's interesting to see that this, this idea of attention continues mm-hmm. on in the story well, as well. Well, it's, 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 this idea of attention is extremely important because it's easy to think of attention and cognition, let's say, or even rationality as somehow equivalent, but they're importantly different because rationality builds towers of Babel, let's say, and rationality makes presumptions about the world. But attention is a precondition for revelation and for rationality, and attention in is in and of itself a kind of openness to the horizon of transformation. And the more, I would say, there's a direct connection between being attentive and even being capable of healing in some real sense. So if you're a clinician, one of the things you learn, and Carl Rogers, the clinician, was a particularly potent writer on this notion that attentive listening in and of itself has a curative capacity. You let people unfold in front of you, or you encourage them to unfold in front of you. And that's not even analytic thought. There can be a strategic component of it, but mostly it's, it's just the devotion of attention. And attention also, in some real sense, sheds light on the darkness because we only see what we attend to. And what we don't see or what we don't perceive in the broadest sense is, in some real sense, not even there. Yeah, so he, they got into a lot there. We talked about you know, the call to adventure and sacrifice. Uh, but they also talked about um, you know, this idea of the Tower of Babel. So can you comment on both of those and what your thoughts are? Yeah, I, the idea that God is called, that this specific moment of God calling Moses and saying he's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying that those things, he's the God of sacrifice, I don't really know what he's getting at there. Um, uh, sorry, there's a bit of an echo. I'm not sure if that's on your end, too, on my voice here. But, yeah, I'm not sure what exactly uh, he means by God of sacrifice. Is he saying that... Um, that you have to give something up like is he talking about ritual sacrifice i'm not sure he's just kind of using language in a in specific way, unspecific way uh, i guess the idea of adventure could be derived here you know it's a calling god calling moses to do something big so sure okay we'll give we'll give some points there the idea that babel is rationality builds towers of babel is what he said uh, that's kind of an inscrutable phrase i don't really know what he means there Babel is not necessarily about rationality. It's about assuming that humans can dwell with the divine and that their own name can be, be the greatest. The, 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 the making a name great will actually be contra in chapter Genesis 11 will be contrasted in Genesis 12, where, where God says to Abraham, I will make your name great. So God is the one who has to make a name great. Right. And so there's this, this, this contrast and parallel there. Um, then Babel, it, it, yeah, it's not about rationality. It's about um, this idea that we in our own power and our own evil designs can dwell with God. God is totally fine with my empire, essentially. God will dwell here with us in our empire. Um, so it's not a critique of rationality, but of pride, of assumption, uh, of assuming kind of the ways of life. Uh, our ways of life don't matter when it comes to the divine dwelling with us, which is the antithesis to the Eden narrative and them being kicked out, right? They're building their own cosmic mountain with the ziggurat. So rational thinking, um, I don't think that's antithetical to God. Um, that's what Peterson is, is seems to be assuming when he says Babel is rationality. I mean, he could be saying there's, the, he'd be getting at the idea of uh, the theme of civilization being a possible evil. And we could see that maybe in the early chapters of Genesis, this a line of Cain produces all sorts of stuff, uh, music, medis, and there could be kind of this critique against the city life. Um Babel could be kind of the culmination of an empire-like city that the author is critiquing. So if Peterson's getting at that, but I don't think he is. I think he's saying rationality is Babel, and I, he's a rational person himself in many respects, and is trying to promote that. I just don't understand his his line of uh, line of reasoning, his rationale here. So uh, maybe you could say that Babel is a negative story about like collective wisdom or thought from an empire. So that kind of thinking like a collective mindset or something i don't know but it, it's not rationality per se i don't really follow especially in light of the Babel story yeah i've had a lot of the same question you have so uh so let's 
Peter, they talk about, you know, shame must be overcome to engage in conversation with God. Uh, you know, Peterson goes on to explain yoga poses. Uh, yeah. Prager talks about, <laughs> uh, he says, I cannot think of a natural explanation for the Torah and the radical innovation of monotheism, let alone ethical monotheism, any more than I can think of a rational explanation for the creation of the universe or of the uni human being or consciousness. What are your thoughts on that one? Yeah, he says that the Torah is particularly talking about the Pentateuch and it seems Exodus. He says that this is presenting monotheism and that that's really problematic, um, especially because, again, here's an issue. And we talked about this in our last video where there is a, a million books sitting behind him on the subject and yet he hasn't seen any of them. Right. The idea that Israelites were initially monotheistic in the sense that we consider monotheism, it just doesn't seem to be the case. I mean, even think about Exodus 23, you will have no other gods. It doesn't say you will have no other gods. It says you will have no other gods, Alpine, uh, opposite my face. Um, like it literally means something like against or opposite to, to my face. Uh, that is it, occupying the same space or time or space as, as Yahweh. It's like if you picture the temple and there's the, where there should be an idol at the back of it in the Holy of Holies, you shouldn't have another idol there another figurine like that's what it's getting at and so that that figurine be representing a deity and so um it seems like he doesn't he's not aware that they're probably presuming here uh something more like henotheism or, or mono monolatry that's the idea of a worship of a single god who is before all but that there there might actually be other deities out in the world and the, the text seems to imp to state things like oh baal or or um who, whoever name, name astra, astra or name your deity and they're there but we are worshiping uh our god and there's no one else in the temple in the place with him and it also seems like uh the, the it's the, the the biblical text promotes like a mono yahwism so that is, there's only one kind of yahweh not yahweh of such and such place and yahweh of such and such a place there's just one yahweh is one and we worship that yahweh um that that seems to be more of the thrust, but they do. There does seem to be an acknowledgement of other deities existing in the world. However, you want to frame that in your own world, in your own perspective, um, and it, it's, it's a polytheistic worldview in that sense. Not that they are, but every, everyone else kind of is here, um, and they're, they seem to be kind of placing one Elohim above the rest. And Elohim just means a spirit being. So you could. There are lots of other Elohim. There are other spirit beings, but um, we have the spirit being, this one who's above all, right? And it never says that there weren't other Elohim who existed. And so these Elohim could be other gods. And you kind of have to try to get into their enchanted worldview. And so saying Exodus says monotheism. It's like, whoa, you're not, there's a lot more going on here. And this is not the scholarly consensus. And I, I don't even want to say consensus. This is not how most Old Testament scholars would picture um, Israel's relation to their deity and other deities in, the, in their ancient context. So I don't know where he's getting it from Exodus because it's just an assumption. Yeah, no, that's a very good point. Uh, we we even see that kind of today where if you go somewhere overseas where they're, you know, polytheists and you say, hey, like the Christian God, they're, they're just like, we're going to add it to another list. And um, I think that's maybe what we kind of see in the Israelite story where they're coming out of Exodus and, and Egypt and they... Uh, they're you know the gods are uh, yahweh is like hey this is me and moses is like follow this god and then uh you know and then later in the text we kind of see they're they're immediately doing this golden calf and maybe that actually is yahweh or i don't know what your thoughts on that one <laughs> but um yeah it, you, you there's there's a whole conversation and go to michael heiser if you want more on that one uh so <laughs> elohim uh Elohim just means spirit being. That's what you said. Uh, I'm curious, though, like my, my understanding is that Elohim can be used differently. And each time it's used, it, it can have different meanings each time that it doesn't just mean spirit being. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Do yeah. you want to clarify on that one? Oh, yeah. I was I was just trying to be simple for sim for simplicity's sake. Yeah. I mean, if you say like we said in the last video, if you say Ha Elohim in Exodus, it's referring to to, Yah to the God of Israel. And so it, it, it uh, meaning is always dependent on context, just that Elohim doesn't mean monotheistic God. 
one god. That's all I was kind of getting at. Okay, cool. All right, just making that clear. All right, so uh, later they talk about not seeing God and how later that there is a talk about only seeing God's feet. Uh, interesting point there. Uh, Prager mentions that God is apart from nature in Genesis. God tells man to subdue nature, which means they are connected to God. Only God self-exists. Uh, they mention how it's the situation is similar to the Tower of Babel and the apple. Apple that Eve eats, where you know pride closes us off from the connection to God. Uh, Peugeot mentions that uh, the world thinks it's autonomous from God. And uh, Peterson says something really interesting. I want to get your thoughts on. He says it's easy for the person, in some sense, to usurp the position of God. And one of the things that's puzzling me about the recent insistence that people can self-define their own existence is that they're tripping to themselves in some real sense the omniscience, omnipotence, and omnipresence of God because their stance is something like, I am that I am. Uh, do you have any thoughts on that one? Yeah, I mean, we can touch on this a bit later too when they get into the divine name. But to say that the I am that I am means uh, omniscience, omnipotence, omnipresence, and that that's what people are doing um, in the modern world. Well, you need to really get at the I am that I am. What does that actually mean in its original context? And I know they're going to talk about the name a bit later. And I think we should we should probably save this one for that. OK, let's do that. OK, so later, uh, Exodus 3, 7 and 9, they talk about how God hears the cry of the oppressed Israelites. Uh, it's going to definitely be a fun one. Uh, Peterson, in regards to God calling the people to a land with milk and honey, he says, what you see is the, the emphasis on the fact that the current tyranny is unsustainable and ethically undesirable and that it needs to be transcended and that the proper counterposition that is the hypothetical land of milk and honey. And so that's, well, that's fat and sugar fundamentally. And if you're a hungry people, then that's definitely a vision of paradise. But there's a there's an archetypal structure to this because we're always moving from an insufficient and tyrannical current state. It's not in sync with the horizon of the future. And it's corrupted by our own presuppositions and our sins in some sense. And we're always moving to a better place. And that's actually the motive force in life. And if you look at us, neuropharmacologically and biologically when you see is what you see is that the system that fills us with enthusiasm so that's the spirit of god in the etymological sense are the same persons that mark our progress towards a uh, def destination of value and so there's a concurrence of neurologically between the degree to which you're aiming up a steep pinnacle your movement for that upper aim and the degree to which you're filled with enthusiasm and positive emotion and that also regulates negative emotion suffering anxiety and so you see this fundamental narrative the fundamental narrative substructure and some sense of perception reflected here i really wish i would have worked on a peterson accent for that long skill uh but what are your thoughts on uh the whole milk and honey and like i don't know it's just overall way of reading things yeah, yeah, a Peterson accent, that, that'd be good. The fundamental narrative and fundamental narrative substructure and in some sense perception reflected here. Something like that. <laughs> nice. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, uh, I really don't know what he said. I'm going to be honest. I can't follow. But that is a really um, wordy and... I'm going to be honest. It seems either like, I think you, yeah, we've talked about this. It's either incoherent or brilliant and I'm not sure which it is. And I can't really say much about that whole spiel. Uh, I mean, you could talk about milk and honey, which probably relates to cultivated goods, milk and wild goods, honey, both the farm and the field being productive. Egypt is called the land of milk and honey in the book of Numbers, and so is Canaan. So it's like, it's not just Canaan as this, it's it's just a way of referring to, to it seems like these two things. And it's not just fat and sweet, like Peterson says. If they wanted to refer to something that was more valuable in the form of fat, you'd talk about animal fat, because animals um, were very expensive in that day. Milk is less expensive, oils are a little less expensive. Um, animals are costly. So I think it's referring to this, it's probably getting at something like cultivated goods and wild goods. Um, but this whole neurobiological, pharmacological substructure narrative. Okay. 
Yeah. <laughs> My thoughts exactly. Okay, so uh, Guinness, uh, he said, "Oh, this is this is perfect because you know we're I'm hearing this from the clip and it's like, what?" And, and I Guinness, then he says, "Jordan, uh, he's he's British, okay, Jordan." Yeah. You're making it archetypal, but this is historical, which is a reference to the covenant that God made with Abraham. And <laughs> you really appreciate Oz there, you know, saying exactly what a lot of us are thinking. Yeah, yeah, he tries to bring it back to the biblical, historical, theological context. So thanks, Oz. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's interesting. I really wish they would have dove deep there and like... Uh, maybe talk about Peterson's and maybe Oz's like opinions on like what meaning the text has and kind of what we've done here. Um, so uh, I'd love to know Peterson's like, what is reasoning behind and what he thinks the text of the Bible is. Um, so uh, yeah, Peter can, Peterson, he concludes by saying, this is a passage about the drive of humans for goal orientation. So maybe he, like he, he lowers his claim. I don't know exactly what he was doing there. Um, so then uh, they talk about what is the cause for God to want to save Israelites all of a sudden? It's a really deep, deep question. Um, like, is it Moses' character? Or what do you think? Yeah. Uh, Peterson implies that it's Moses' character here. Um, but I think there's. you also need to take into account the broader narrative again. So there's a theodicy kind of set up in Genesis 15 that he says to Abraham, you know, that the, the sins are not full yet of the land. And so it's going to be time that you're going to spend in Egypt. Your people are going to spend in Egypt. So the, the text does say why this is kind of going on and why God would save them. It kind of sets it up already. Uh, Peugeot says it's the slaughter of the kids, which is probably right in part. That's why God saves. But I think it's probably right because the promise line is being threatened again. So this promise being threatened. Um, Peterson says it's, it's like the law of compensation. The lowest thing makes the highest thing happen. I, I'm, I'm not sure about that. Uh, but it's, it is, it's a difficult thing and theodicy is always difficult. And so it's, it's a discussion in and of itself. And they talk a lot about that and th they say a lot of good things about suffering and why, why it might happen and how do we deal with the, the, um, unspeakable nature of some suffering in the world. So they get, they get into some good stuff that way. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so when you meant about like the line of saving the line of, I guess, the Israelites, you're referring to, I guess, the um, the 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 seed shall crush the serpent's head. And I guess the Abraham's promise and how it seems like Genesis is a story of like, I guess, where the seed's going to come from. Is that kind of what you're getting at or something different? That's exactly it. No, you got it. All right. Yeah, I, I got a video on my channel if you want to check that out, guys. Um, so uh, later it talks about Moses killing the Egyptian slave master. I'm, um, uh, they say, uh, I'm saying that, that, well, he went too far and learned and was punished for it. But you have to go too far to know what is too far. And the prayer says, in Christian commentary, he sinned and killing the Egyptians. But I've never accepted that. Thoughts? Yeah, Prager's, yeah. Well, first off, it's very strange to, or might be problematic to say, go and murder someone to know how too far, too far is too far. Because uh, that's, to, to go too far, to know what is too far, that's, that's, that's a bit much, maybe. It's kind of along the lines of the whole, from the last video, the hot or cold. Be bad, so you, because God wants you to either be bad or be good. Um, and that Prager saying that he should, should have killed the Egyptian. I mean, that's surprising. I mean, you got to think about the law here. Uh, the law coming later will say that um, hitting someone is not worthy of the death penalty. You'd have to kill them. And all that hap is happening here is that the Egyptian is hitting the Hebrew. So um, the law itself says he shouldn't have killed him here. And, and I think that's hinted at when he looks both ways, right? Because he's he's doing premeditated murder. So I, I'm surprised that Gregor would say that, um, that it's a good thing that he killed him because that seems to be against the flow of the text. Yeah. So later they uh, they mentioned you could imagine in some sense that what Moses is having here when he encounters the burning bush is something like an aesthetic experience, right? It's profoundly attractive, at least. Perhaps it's not beautiful, but perhaps it isn't. So that beauty is calling to him and calls him into a relationship that 
then transform into itself into something transcendent, but he is also pre prepared for that character logically. Uh, just from that word, it sounds like that's Peterson talking. Uh, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, in some ways, I guess you could say this is right. I think um, the point is actually more to focus on the progressive rev revelation of Yahweh in fire. It starts in the small bush early on, and it becomes a pillar of fire. Then it becomes this volcanic firestorm at Sinai. That's kind of like what's going on with this fire motif. Um, and you actually might have a pun here with the word bush. Like, I think it's Sina. sounds like Sinai. And so, um, and this is happening on Horeb on Sinai. And so I think that's might be what be going on with the burning and the bush and all. And this, this is kind of the pun and continuing kind of growth of the fire revelation. But yeah, I mean, it's, it, again, maybe a half right on, on Peterson there. Yeah, okay. Uh, so then Pajil, he talks about how Moses was the only one since all the other males died. It was almost like a starting over. And then Prager mentioned, asked the question, does God turn all evil into God? Which is a really deep question. Uh, you know, he, they say, if he will turn everything into God, why fight evil if he's going to make it good himself? And, you know, you can't untorture someone. So it's like, uh, it doesn't exactly make it all better i think it's what they're getting at um peugeot says we are the hands and feet of god god chooses man by distributing his power and that definitely seems to be the way that god works in a lot of ways what are your thoughts on um well actually let's go to this next one from from god's timeless perspective assuming that god is a timeless being and i think there's warrant for that in the passage of exodus and elsewhere you might say that god apprehends Hence, all reality is a kind of blinding flash, a similar to a blinding flash of simultaneity and evaluates it in those terms, in those as it were timeless terms. And it may be, though, it's difficult for us to grasp this caught up in the horrors of the Holocaust and other tragedies. It's difficult for us from our temporal perspective to grasp what this kind of evaluation might be. So that you're talking about the morality of God. Uh, what are your thoughts? Well, just this whole timelessness, simultaneity thing, um, it's dipping into the realm of philosophy. I'm not a formal philosopher. Uh, there are certain t theories of time that get debated and theories of how God experiences time and his relationship to time. Um, my problem with this one is more when they say in the pages of Exodus. Uh, Exodus doesn't present God like the character God outside of time. It's actually the opposite. God is walking alongside people in real time. In fact, the character of God is so bound to time in the book of Exodus that you'll um, often see that Moses has to hike up the mountain to get God to talk to him. He's a character. He's on a mountain. And so it's like it, he's not trans temporal. He's not like he's, he's, he's a character in the story. So uh, God on the mountain is he, he's on the mountain and he can only be conversed with there. Um, so I think that saying in the book of Exodus, that's just not getting at Exodus. Some, some may, might make the case that the Old Testament portrays God as bound to time in his relationships with humans. Um, they think this makes more sense of God changing his mind and responding to people's prayers like Moses in Exodus 32. But again, that's kind of going to get away from our discussion right now. I just don't think right. they get it from the pages of Exodus is what they said. Yeah, well, it's an interesting discussion specifically because they have a lot of philosophers on the table. So it uh, makes for an interesting conversation. So like Later, Exodus 3, 9, 13, uh, the book, Moses asked God why God, or Moses asked why God asks him to help Israelites. Peterson question, he says, Moses is perplexed about why God would, would have to do that. And they're kind of talking about whether that's humility or pride going on there. Uh, Peugeot says, uh, God says he will speak through Moses. Peterson says something about a politician politician and prophetic dynamic you guys can watch about watch that if you want to get into that uh, a few minutes later peterson uh, mentions that the hebrew word for which help me is translated in the king james version it means beneficial adversary uh prayer mentions you know i supposed to know hebrew here he says hebrew is a helpmate when that means who is equal to god peterson responds by saying does it have that beneficial adversary flavor Prager says, well, and get also means again. So uh, I really want to know your commentary. I've, I've kind of studied this a little bit. What do you think? I mean, does this help meet term, uh, Ezer, Azer, and Hebrew, what does that mean? And uh, is it what they're saying here? 
Yeah, Azer Konegdo is the Hebrew. And Pre uh, Peterson's claim is that there's this beneficial adversary claim uh, flavor to it. And then Prager kind of concedes and says, or uh, agrees and says that neged means against. And neged could, can mean against. Um, it's a preposition. But um, we have to take words and phrases in context. Uh, just because a word can mean something doesn't mean that it does mean that in that specific context. Um, if I say, sorry, Zach, our meeting is going to be canceled. I don't mean that a bunch of people are going to protest our meeting, like cancel our meeting, you know, the modern cancel. Uh, I mean, uh, I mean, that the meeting is not going to happen. So context matters. Phraseology matters. So just because negative can mean against, it's not, it doesn't mean it means it here, especially in this phrase. So connecto, um, a corresponding to him, uh, it seems to imply more of like a competence and a quality. Um, she's standing opposite him, like, like I'm standing here and you're standing here kind of thing, like against. Um, or uh, something like that, like a, like more of a spatial idea. Um, and they're standing opposite to fulfill the role of a partner to support what the, the man was told to do, which is to work and to keep the garden. So I like what Imes says, Carmen Imes, says that the word Ezra occurs as a common noun over 90 times in the Old Testament, but it never refers to what servants or subordinates do for their masters. So it's a term used for allies in battle or for gods, people who are helping in a way that's not just a, oh, you're my nice helper here, hold my my cup of tea or my suitcase or something like that, like a, like a menial servant. It's actually a servant, a necessary help, someone who is coming in and I need them. Um, so I think it, so the idea of a beneficial adversary is a weird translation. That's, a, that's just negative connotations going on there. This, there's nothing negative connoted here. This is a, a positive definition and to introduce the idea of adver, of an adversary is I think counter to the text. And again, it's, it's this etymological reading of neged in Konegdo that um, is not warranted because words have meaning in context um, and Ezra has a meaning in context and this whole phrase has a meaning in context and you can't pick apart the pieces do not create the whole pieces. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. And Exodus 3.14, Moses asks whose God's name is and he says, I am that I am. And then Peterson says the tense of the verb is indeterminate. So it could also be I was that I am and I will become what I will become. And so it's not only self-referential, so God in some sense says that he is the essence of being itself, or but it's not just being the present, it's all the past, all the present, and all the future, all at once. So there, here's some other translation of that. I am that I am, the presence of being across time. These are biblical translations. There's an element of self-reference, an element of awareness, an element of becoming as unfolding, an idea that that which was hidden will be revealed an element of to know the place for the first time. Distinction between being an objective existence of all that seems to be tangled up in the mystery of God's name. And then uh, Peterson, uh, on the rest of 314, Exodus 314, he says, and he said, thou, thou shalt, thou, thus shalt thou say unto all the children of Israel, I am. And so it's it's being itself, like that being and becoming the ground of being, the ground of being has sent me forth to address it. And uh, Ben Prager comments, he says, just help everyone. I think that in Hebrew, there's no am. When he refers to I am that I am, God doesn't say that. It's what Prager's saying. saying. To be has no present verb, by the way. It's very common. Arabic doesn't have it. Russian doesn't have it. Because let's say I want to say in Russian, I am a doctor. It doesn't matter. Or, or I am Dennis. Yeah. Dennis, everyone knows you don't need it. it. Am is really unnecessary when you think about it. Translation is, I will be what I will be. So this is a whole concept and discussion and the, the idea of language and Hebrew and all that for what I am, I am, and all that kind of stuff means. So what is your take? Yeah, so again, this is probably another really good example of the red flag of nobody has done any work on this because this is huge in biblical studies and another another case of a thousand books behind them that they haven't turned to look at and i mean some of the things that peterson says are flat wrong uh the idea that the tense of the verb is indeterminate is wrong it's the imperfect or the prefix conjugation so the translation peterson game i was that i am i've never heard anyone suggest that i don't know where he's getting that from 
Um, elsewhere, Peterson says that um, they, modern people, are attributing to themselves the omnis of God. We talked a bit about that. Um, their stance, is, he says, their stance is, I am that I am. So he's saying this this ground of being thing he's talking about, well, that's what people are doing uh, now. My, my question is, what does the phrase actually mean, right? Peterson is taking it as autonomy. I think he means, I am self-existent. Uh, that might not actually be what God's name means, though. The, the idea of autonomy, that's that's kind of right, but I don't think Peterson gets there by gets to this idea by analyzing the phrase. He's kind of just riffing off his own ideas, which are vaguely based on an English translation. Um, and this is a problem because there's a history of scholarship here that, like I said, no one's touching on. Uh, the divine name Yahweh, uh, which you find in chapter 3, is kind, of, kind of verse 13 to 15, uh, I am that I am. Uh, you, you'll say that I am sent you, and then you've got, it, it, it becomes this uh, yod hey vav hey uh, Yahweh, uh, the Tetragrammaton, people people call it, scholars call it. Uh, it. It might be based on the verb to be. In later Hebrew, to be is is from, it's haya, and um, Yahweh could be representative of the, like, the third person masculine singer form, Yehye, which would be yod hey yod hey he will be. And it actually could also be Yahya, as in he will cause to be. And so it's a different, um, so it's just one vowel difference, but it can actually change the meaning because there's a different stem, the hephil. Uh, and, but the thing is, in proto Canaanite, so you notice Yod, He, Yod, He is not Yod, He, Vav, He. So in proto Canaanite, like this pro, this progenitor to Hebrew, to be is um, He, Vav, Yod, with the third person masculine singular being something like Yahweh. Um, and so that would make more sense of, of yod hey vav hey, um, which is Yahweh, right? So it might actually be reflecting an earlier form of the, of the language or, uh, or of a dialect related to it. And, it that, and so that could be he will be or he will cause to be. Um, we find, uh, we mentioned this, I think, in the last video, early Southern sources calling Yahweh Yahoo. Uh, there's also yeah, potentially Yahweh, Yahuwah. Uh, apparently, the Mount allegedly the Mount Ebal inscription has Yahoo, but let's not get into that Mount Ebal thing quite yet until that's out. Um, both are arguably shortened forms of of of, Yah, of Yahweh, Yah, Yahweh. So it's like there's a lot going behind this name. So it could be he will be, he will cause to be, but it also could be from a South Semitic root of 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 Hey Vav Hey, uh, as in to cause for rain to fall, and like this idea of the storm god motif, which is very common in like Ugaritic materials and, and and things like that. Um, and so it and the third person masculine would be also be like a, a, a Yahweh. And so th th there's arguments made for that too, that this is actually not to be, but it's causing like weather events, rain. And so that's another way of taking it. Um, and then we've got, we've got Exodus coming and you got to, you got to figure out what, what this text is, uh, the original name behind it, which might be kind of like this Midianite in origin origin. And you've got to figure out what's it saying in Exodus itself. Um, and of course, there's the, all the history of the name not being pronounced later on. The Septuagint giving us kurios for the translation of, of the Tetragrammaton. Um, but the, back to the question, what does it, I will be what I will be, or whatever this phrase um, is, what, is that, what, what does it mean? It could refer to like a self-existence or an otherness, and that's kind of the Masoretic vowel pointing. But the Alex X, my, my wheelhouse, translates it as ego i mi haon. I am the the being or the some or, so it's, it's it seems to be riffing on Greek philosophical language of ha own it's all over the place in that, lit, that literature, so that might like support Peterson's hypothesis of existence I am pure existence or something like that, but it's it's also very possible and probably I think more probable that it's it's a causative Yahweh so you got that changed vowel like I said underneath the A class, um, and as in I will cause to be what I will cause to be, so not quite I am. That I am. Uh, and this syntactical construction is called the idem per idem formula. You see it elsewhere. Um, it, it, it refers to like the subject can do the action in whatever way they see fit. So like in Genesis, you've got, uh, oh, I, if I am bereaved, I am bereaved, as in like, I'll be bereaved in any way I, I choose. Um, you've got, I'll be gracious to him, I'll be gracious. In Exodus saying like, I'm going to, it's my up to me to, for how I'll be gracious. Um, and so it's interesting that I will be what I will be, or I will cause to be what I will cause to be might actually be God dodging Moses question here. Like God can choose to be whatever God pleases, or he can do whatever God pleases. And it's, it's actually not, I'm not going to answer you is almost what 
it might be what Moses is getting or what God is getting at here. He's almost dodging it. Like, you'll see what I am. You're going to see as I reveal myself in my character. And so this is whole debate here about what the meaning of Yahweh is, where it originates from. Is it causative? I will be caused to be. Is it I will be or I am that I am? Um, is it, this, yeah, uh, the storm god motif? All of this, uh, it's all up in the air. This is a huge debate behind the name. And these guys don't even touch it, right? They don't even, they don't seem to be aware of it. They're assuming this self-existence thing. And so in a way, Peterson might get at it if it does mean like I am, Yahweh saying I can do whatever I want to do. Okay, maybe then it's getting at, uh, then, and then by analogy to a some sort of modernist mindset of I am self-autonomous, like I guess so, but they're not, they've just, they're just assuming again the meaning without touching on anything else where this is a highly contested issue in biblical studies that it would be nice for at least somebody to come in, and this is kind of the point of these series uh, or of this, this these discussions we're having, uh, that just like have a biblical scholar, a biblical studies person there to go, hey, yeah, but there's also this. And rather than everyone just now hearing this, latching on and going, that's it, that's the meaning, and now I'll spend the rest of my life with that meaning because Jordan Peterson said it, right? And so it's just important that things are tempered and that we approach things like a lot of these, like Jordan's done scientific research. We're scientific in our approach. That's the goal, to be as 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 thoughtful as we can and not just riff endlessly without substantiation. Yeah, so I mean obviously Peterson doesn't know he's you know, he's you know, he's he's heard some things I would assume and he's just uh relaying them to you know what he might think it is. But you know, this prayer he's he's a, I'm pretty sure he's a Jew. He he grew up uh in the in the Hebrew language. Um but you're kinda it seems like you're being a little hard because it's like how could you say that someone that grew up speaking Hebrew, how would he not know this? Like, what do you think about that idea? I, I just think that some people aren't ever informed on the debate. Someone tells them the meaning and they just go forward with it. And we don't know actually know how how much he reads of Hebrew. What like he just says he knows Hebrew. I don't quite know what that means. Um I'd have to talk with him about how much he uses it, things like that. Peterson and James Orr, they talk about trans transcendence and how we view transcendence while doing science. Interesting conversation there. Uh, James Orr, you re references Peterson and his Genesis commentary uh, that, uh, you know, Peterson made the claim that being goodness are linked together in these in the Genesis story. Uh, Stephen Blackwood talked about how God is seen in Exodus as the God of love. Uh, they talk about evolutionary mechanisms in love. How does you, you human yearning for something transcendent? Uh, Oz Guinness talks about uh, Moses has a huge task. The pyramid has been there for a thousand years. I mean, if you, if you really think about it, like Moses is really going up against this entire, like, huge civilization of the day. And um, I mean, if you think about it, put it in his shoes, it's pretty crazy, I mean, actually. Um, Moses' shoes, at least. And then, uh, Peterson, the, he makes an interesting claim. He says, he doesn't only free the Israelites, he frees every person that's free from tyrant oppression for the next 2,000 years. So Peterson's reading the Exodus text and, you know, allegorically, like, putting ourselves in Moses' shoes is that uh, Moses frees everyone from tyrant oppression as well. Um, <laughs> I don't I don't really know what to say to that. Do you have any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's an... It's just assuming anytime anyone gets out of tyranny that that is the same thing as the Exodus, which I mean, that's a pretty big claim that should he should talk about more. And is God freeing every person who's ever freed from tyranny? Is that the hand of God? Um, this gets into discussions about how God is working in the world. How does God work in the world? What the purpose of Israel is? What the purpose of the Exodus was? Is it a paradigm for all uh, freedom from tyranny? Is it a story about God bringing about um, what we talked about in the, the pre previous per, uh, video about bringing about ultimate internal um, freedom from tyranny because the external freedom from tyranny actually didn't help. It, like, I mean, it's good, but they still have, they still turn away. Right. And so there has to be a heart change. Um, there's a lot of things to discuss here. Yeah. I think he's just kind of riffing. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. I mean, I certainly, he doesn't think that the Exodus story is literally talking or supposed to be written to talk to ever like to speak to everyone in existence for the next three thousand years. Uh, so in some ways, it's like I don't 
have any idea what he's really saying, but I think that, yeah, that makes yeah. more, like, sense. Um, so uh, then later they say, do you know, do you know what Yahweh means uh, in Hebrew? It's for reasons I've never figured out this breaker uh, saying this. Uh, when I wrote my commentary, I didn't see this anywhere. I'm sure I'm not the first person to point this out. And then Peter says, but can you even say the name Yahweh? And then Prager says, not unless you're a priest. Uh, I mean, it seems like Yahweh's asking this question of, can you say the name Yahweh in a context when that was perfectly fine to say? Is that right? Yeah, no, they, they you could say the name of Yahweh in early Israelite times. It only seems to be in the Persian period where that starts to develop. Um, and there seems to be the problem with naming the name as the Septuagint, we'll, we'll put it. Yeah, uh, Persian period, that's like, what, three, 400 BC, something like that? Yeah, 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 yeah. well, yeah, 325, kind of before, around there, to, f yeah, 400s. All right. Um, 400s. Yep, so, so then uh, then they end by kind of talking about how God, uh, in Exodus three fifteen to 22, where God tells Moses to tell the Israelites that he's, going to take them to a land um and there's one last thing i would talk about which is uh this clip protestantism was that the critique of catholicism is that it might fall prey to the authoritarianism that's in some sense implicit in the roman-like structure of the church and the hierarchy that's there but his critique of protestantism the danger there was that everyone would become their own church and then their identity would become self-proclaimed in some fundamental sense because with no mediating structures between the divine and the person, it's easy for the person in some sense to usurp the position of God. And one of the things that puzzled me about the recent insistence people can self-define their own existence is that they're attributing to themselves in a real sense the omniscience, omnipotence, right. and... Uh, omnipresence of God, because their state is something like, I am that I am. Yeah, that's why it's pride. Yeah, right, right, right. And and, and I, I really see those things as tightly linked. It's one of the things that's tilted me, I would say, ethically in a more conservative direction, because even in the psychotherapeutic literature, you see this Rousseau-like underpinning, which more or less assumes that sanity is part and parcel of the autonomous individual. And so there's there's a Rousseauian element there, there's a Protestant element, and a l classic liberal element. And I fall and prayed that to some degree by thinking of the sovereign individual as the fundamental unit of, of value. And, but then, I, I, and this is partly under the influence of Piaget and, and the theorists of play, and the people who made the case that identity comes out of negotiation, that in order to be sane, which is something other than, let's say, self-actualized in the, in the narrow sense, you have to be positioned in these higher structures. So you have a partner without a long-term partner, let's say, or if you don't have a long-term partner, you better have some children or some parents, and if you don't have them, you better have some friends, and if you don't have them, you better at least have some colleagues and a town and a city and a state and a country all the way up the hierarchy, and that what the sanity then becomes is the symphony-like ordering of that entire structure rather than the autonomous health of the autonomous psyche self-defined also conjuring up the notion that all of that embeddedness is nothing but an imposition in the manifestation of your autonomous self which is also something that rousseau would tilt towards right but, but Jordan, that doesn't come from Protestantism. That goes right back to the early temptation. You shall be as God. Mm -hmm. Now, Protestantism certainly reinforces one extreme. You're right about that. You think, say, of Heine's famous description of Marx, you are a godless self-god. Mm -hmm. yeah, right, 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 right. Because that's the alternative. Well, that very thing if it's real and the lack of embedding is what is right for manipulation mm -hmm. right because you can move you can move this is what we're seeing with sort of you know mob-like mentality throughout the culture across the spectrum because you can move people like a school of fit 
trash because they're not bad. Companies. And that's tech in the text. That's what we saw at the beginning. Pharaoh, that's what Pharaoh wants to do. Pharaoh wants to reduce the Israelites to potential so that he can then rule over them and manipulate them. He doesn't want families. He doesn't want all these embedded structures which create this normal py pyramid. Well, and those we, are alternative sources of power and structure as well. That yeah, would, that would but that they, should, they don't have to be, comp they don't compete. That, that either family or a structure of, of communion doesn't compete with our relationship with God. It actually becomes a place where it can happen. And that's why the laws, right? When the God gives the laws, they're all modes of communion. They're not just a bunch of like rules or moral rules, they're oh, methods. They're methods of being together and of, of only loving each other. That's methods what of negotiation. So Pharaoh makes them slaves. See, and Hayek would say that's what modern collectivism does: makes us serfs. Mm -hmm. uh, make sure to check out our first part one if you haven't already. Uh, Dr. Kretko, I hope hope you have a great rest of your day. Thanks so much. Cheers. Awesome.